All right, cool. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into it. Uh, thanks for sticking around for the last talk of the conference. You never know uh, what the turnout's going to be like, so I appreciate it. Um, my name is Dan Mangum. I work at a company called Goliath. Uh, we make an IoT platform, and today I'm going to be talking about WebAssembly on Zephyr, but the talk is pretty expansive, so I'm going to be moving pretty quickly. We're going to start off with talking about just what uh, WebAssembly is and how it works. Uh, then we're going to move into kind of talking about dynamic code execution in general, when you should do it, when you shouldn't do it, what some of the alternatives are, uh, and then round out with actually looking at um, a demo of running WebAssembly. Uh, on Zephyr and, and talk about what some of the attributes of that are. So let's go ahead and jump in uh, to kind of an introduction here uh, with how WebAssembly works. Uh, so effectively in any environment where you're going to be running WebAssembly, you start out with uh, what the spec refers to as an embedder. This is basically the host environment in which a WebAssembly module or multiple WebAssembly modules are going to run. For an embedder, uh, in order to run a WebAssembly module, you need to get a binary uh, representation of that WebAssembly module. That could be um, you know, anything from on disk to fetch over the network. Uh, we're going to be talking about a variety of different models for um, accessing WebAssembly modules today. So once you get that WebAssembly module, you go through a number of steps in order to actually um, invoke uh, code that is in that WebAssembly module. So those steps are broadly going through decoding, validation, and execution. And these are all core parts uh, of what makes WebAssembly useful uh, in some cases. So looking at decoding, uh, this is runtime defined. So depending on what WebAssembly runtime uh, you're actually using, the representation of a module instance, which is what we're moving towards here, uh, is defined by the runtime, so it may look different. Uh, frequently, it's represented as some sort of abstract, abstract syntax tree, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. And especially in more constrained environments, uh, there may be other ways to represent it uh, that can help with code size and things like that. Uh, then you go through a set of validation. So you're basically taking that representation, running it through a number of specs, a, num a number of attributes in the spec uh, that classify it as well-defined and ensuring um, that it uh, is a valid WebAssembly module. And then you move into execution. And execution is really what we care about, right? We want some functionality out of this WebAssembly module. So there's two steps to uh, execution. You start off with instantiation uh, and then invocation. Instantiation is uh, exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you need to provide definitions for imports, so things that the WebAssembly module is, are going to access uh, that are provided by the embedder or the host environment. You need to initialize globals and memories and things like that. Um, and then if the WebAssembly module has a start function, um, just like any executable, that is typically run during instantiation. Now, there is some variability uh, between uh, WebAssembly runtimes as to whether that happens, um, which a lot of times is revolving around security, whether you want to go ahead uh, and execute a function when you're instantiating or you want to wait for invocation. Um, so if there's a start function, that's the time in which it runs. And then in invocation, uh, you're basically pulling an exported function out of that WebAssembly module, and uh, you're invoking it from the host environment. And you may pass it some arguments. Um, and if you're going to pass it arguments or receive arguments from it, the runtime needs to validate that those arguments are valid. Um, so it validates the number of arguments you have, the types of the arguments. Um, and WebAssembly is a stack machine. So those get passed by putting those on the stack uh, for the WebAssembly module instance, then invoking the exported function, and then it will push the return values onto the stack, which then you can pop off uh, to get values out. Okay, so what is in this module um, that we're creating an instance of, and how are we able to kind of like communicate across boundaries from the host environment uh, and the module instance? Uh, a WebAssembly module looks a lot like uh, any other executable file in that it's made up of sections. Uh, there are a lot of sections here, and there's a lot of different things you can do with WebAssembly modules, um, which are one of the ways that uh, allow it to be so portable. Uh, we're not going to go through all of these today. Uh, I did write a blog post if you're interested in understanding every byte in a WASM module. You can go check that out um, if you have 21 minutes on your hand to look at a lot of uh, hex dumps. Um, but we're going to talk about three specific uh, sections today because they're kind of relevant for how we're going to interact with a WebAssembly module. 
So let's start off with an example module. Uh, one of the things that's going to be kind of a common theme throughout this presentation is that a uh, WASM module um, can, or WASM can be targeted um, by really any language. So we're going to be using Rust uh, as an example today, um, but you can obviously use um, other languages as well. So this is a very simple module. Uh, what we're looking at here is that we have a single function defined um, in the WASM module. Uh, that is maybe alert. It takes a value. It compares the value to a uh, constant uh, value. And if it's over uh, that value, then it's going to trigger an alert function, which is provided by the host environment. Um, and so you can see that we're declaring uh, the alert function, which does not take any arguments or return any values. Once again, a very simple um, module here. Um, and that's going to be provided by the embedder. Uh, typically, when we look at a compiled WASM module and we want to see uh, what's inside of it, we'll represent it uh, with Watt, which is the WebAssembly text representation. Um, and so you can see uh, some of our function body being translated uh, to WebAssembly here, as well as uh, things like the exports um, uh, and imports and, and various uh, signatures for the functions. So starting off, if we look down uh, towards the bottom of our WebAssembly module here, we have a custom section. The custom section uh, can provide really anything. Uh, it's a runtime defined or compiler defined in this case. Um, and so here we're just saying that this was compiled by Rust-C uh, and the language is Rust. Um, but it can also provide third party extensions. Um, one of the things that's really important when working with WebAssembly on microcontrollers um, is the you know, amount of memory we're going to use. And it takes memory to be able to take this WebAssembly module, um, you know, translate it and interpret it, and then execute it. Uh, there's obviously more overhead than just running native code would be. So for an example, some um, uh, WebAssembly runtimes that can be run on microcontrollers will take the native code um, uh, for whatever target it is going to be um, uh, targeted or uh, for multiple targets, shove that into the custom section and actually have it along uh, with the WebAssembly module. So you could have it executed natively um, or interpreted depending on what environment you're in. So you preserve that portability while also um, improving performance in the more constrained environments. Uh, looking at the import, um, that's uh, exactly like we said, we have an alert function. Uh, you can import functions, tables, memories, globals, basically anything that you want uh, the WebAssembly module to be able to access uh, that's outside of its sandboxed environment. Uh, there is a namespacing uh, mechanism for imports. So here you can see we're in the env namespace and we are importing a function uh, with name alert. Um, and the function imports, which is the only kind that we have here, are going to include a signature, which basically uh, allows the WASM module to know how to, or the WASM function that calls it uh, know how to uh, invoke that function. Uh, and these must be available at instantiation, which may be obvious uh, because we mentioned that uh, when you start or inv invoke the start function, uh, you need to have access to all of the imports. Uh, we also have the exports. Uh, so we're exporting a variety of things by default, and then we explicitly uh, mentioned that we would export that maybe alert function, which is going to make that available for um, uh, the embedder uh, host environment to be able to call. Uh, so once again, functions, tables, memories, globals can be exported. Um, and it's not a two level uh, namespace uh, in export, so that was copied over. Um, and these are available after instantiation. Um, all right, so why do we care about these specific sections? Well, I already mentioned the custom section and how that can be um, useful for uh, constrained environments. But for imports and exports, one of the important things to think about is if you're going to put something in a sandbox environment and get some of the benefits that come with that, uh, you're going to need to be able to communicate outside of that sandbox environment to be able to do anything of consequence. Um, so if we're going to share primitive values across the sandbox boundary, WASM only supports very primitive types. So basically, integers and floats uh, are what you're going to be able to pass uh, as function arguments and return values, which significantly limits you know, what you can do. Um, so we're going to pass those primitive values as function arguments um, and return them as values. And if you're going to share complex values uh, without any other mechanisms, typically what you would do is from the host uh, environment, you're going to write into a section of the WASM uh, module instance memory, and then you're going to pass an address 
to a function um, in the WASM module so it knows where to access um, that data in its memory space. Um, but fortunately, uh, lots of people have uh, struggled with this, and it's not a, a great way to pass around more complex values. Um, so there's kind of two components that are important to understand um, in the WebAssembly ecosystem. So the first one is WASI, or the WebAssembly System Interface. This is kind of like POSIX for, um, for WebAssembly. So you can see here the, the kind of summary of it. But basically, it is a standard interface. So think about that alert function that we uh, imported into the WebAssembly module. Um, imagine if you kind of had a, a set of libc functions that were basically available and you could count on those being present. Um, that's kind of what WASI is defining for uh, WebAssembly modules. And you'll see we get a nice call out uh, of embedded devices in the, in the high level summary. The other part of that, which uh, uh, version 0 0.2 of the uh, WebAssembly system interface uh, is built on top of is the component model. So you can imagine if we have lots of WebAssembly modules that are all importing and exporting different functions, it can be very hard for these to interoperate with each other. So the component module uh, goes beyond kind of um, uh, those primitive types uh, in various different imports and exports uh, and allows you to declare interfaces um, that then can be implemented essentially by various WASM modules. This allows you to also combine uh, WebAssembly modules uh, that are compiled from different languages and have different ABIs and that sort of thing to work together um, all at once. So uh, WASI uh, 0.2 uh, is built on the component mod uh, model. All right, so what we care about here, at least today, is WebAssembly on microcontrollers. Uh, for some background, WebAssembly, you know, uh, as is widely known, was primarily built to kind of replace JavaScript um, in a browser context, but it was an explicit goal for that to be able to run uh, elsewhere and also be useful in those environments. So uh, the WebAssembly specification uh, mentions a, a variety of attributes or motivations for um, its design, and they fall into two categories, semantics and representation. Uh, so on the semantics side, we have a number. We're going to go through these individually. Uh, and, and we also have on the representation. But what we're kind of asking ourselves here is, is this better than the status quo, right? Like, why would we want to introduce more complexity um, into our firmware? Um, and, and there's a variety of reasons we may want to do that. Um, but it really comes down to two different categories when you're evaluating these various attributes and whether they would be useful to you. The first is you require dynamic code execution. So you have to be able to do this to accomplish a given use case. Um, I would argue that that's probably less frequent than we might say it is that you need to do that, um, but there are definitely uh, valid scenarios, um, but also evaluating it in the context of it not being required. Um, I think that uh, that significantly constrains the reason why you would want to put uh, an interpreter and a sandbox environment onto a microcontroller, uh, but there are some uh, uh, instances in which that can be useful depending on um, the rest of your system and what's surrounding uh, that embedded device. So uh, does your product require uh, dynamic code execution? Like I said, uh, probably not. So if you don't need to introduce more complexity, let's not add more complexity. Um, let's not use up more of your memory um, in, in your firmware. Um, carefully think about whether you want to do that. Uh, there's also alternatives if you do need dynamic code execution. Um, so I went to a talk earlier today on uh, Lex. And uh, that is you know, native to Zephyr now. Um, and there's a lot of great capabilities there. There are some differences. Um, I'm going to be talking more generally today, comparing kind of like against all alternatives vaguely. Um, but if you want to get more into specifics, uh, we can talk after. Or the folks who work on that subsystem uh, can certainly give more information than I can. All right. So starting off with some of the attributes uh, of WebAssembly uh, is that it uh, strives to be fast. Um, and so it tries to execute with near native code performance. Obviously, when you're interpreting, um, there is overhead compared to native code. Uh, but one of the ways that, uh, the, that WASM is able to get closer to that is by modeling a lot of modern hardware function um, in the WebAssembly virtual ISA, if you will. So uh, WASM strives to be um, as fast or faster than JavaScript. Um, but a lot of times, we're not comparing to running JavaScript when we're talking about microcontrollers. So is WASM going to be faster than C? 
typically not, right? So if you don't need dynamic code execution, you're going to be giving up some performance likely. Um, I will say uh, this is less than or equal to because there are some caveats whenever you're doing um, JIT and being able to get more context uh, when you're compiling on the fly. But uh, if we're talking about whether you need dynamic code execution, uh, is it faster? Uh, in both cases, if you need it or not, you're probably going to be giving up some performance here. Um, so that's a kind of penalty you get uh, for bringing WebAssembly into the picture. When we talk about safety, uh, WebAssembly uh, uh, is very interested in safety because when you're executing um, code in the browser, you're primarily fetching untrusted code from all over the internet. So it's very important that you're able to sandbox that well. Um, that may be less important on a microcontroller because you probably aren't running third-party untrusted code, but in some cases you may be. Um, and in that case, that isolation uh, is useful. Um, so like I said, it's, it's really valuable when you're running multiple untrusted programs. Um, but there are also memory safe alternatives to embedded C. Um, so I know there's been a number of talks about Rust. That's not the only memory safe op option. There are other alternatives as well, um, but that's just one that's obviously been uh, popular as of late. So if you need dynamic code execution, um, this isolation is going to be useful. If you don't need it, there are other ways to get memory safety um, and probably less complex ways as well. So grouping the next uh, few together, uh, well-defined, hardware independent, and language independent. Um, if you're only going to be running code on a microcontroller, doesn't really matter too much if uh, you're hardware and language independent. Um, so you know this isn't bringing too much value for us. Um, it is useful if you're going to be moving that uh, between different environments or potentially onto different microcontrollers. Um, but once again, embedded languages, you know, if you're compiling firmware binaries, uh, you can target different architectures. And obviously, if you have a system like Zephyr, it's really easy to move between different hardware. Um, another thing that's important to note is because we're still doing, um, uh, you know, we're executing in a linear memory space for a WASM module instance, uh, languages that do not have direct memory access um, or can directly access hardware are still going to struggle um, in a context where that's necessary. Um, so if we're passing um, pointers and offsets um, to functions, uh, accessing that memory and working with it, even within a WASM module instance context, uh, is going to be difficult with a language like JavaScript. Um, so if dynamic code execution is not required, um, these are not super, super useful for you. They're also not necessarily super useful for you if you do need it. Um, uh, you can get some of these right with, with uh, Lex or something like that. Platform independence uh, is uh, something that I think is a little more interesting to think about when you view a full context of a system of which an embedded device may be one component. Um, so uh, platform independence is a goal of WebAssembly. Um, and uh, at least uh, at Goliath and uh, in some of the work that I do, we think this is really interesting. Um, so I would say the kind of killer application of WebAssembly uh, in embedded is transferable computation. And when I'm talking about transferable computation, basically saying you can move operations between different types of heterogeneous compute um, depending on what your goals are um, and where you're trying to optimize. Um, so this can be really useful for cases like you want to manipulate data um, at different points of the process of that data getting from an embedded device to ultimately being in a data store. It can be useful for making data-driven decisions, uh, which is something we're going to be looking at a demo for today. Uh, and it can be useful when you're prototyping or experimenting. Um, if you're going to have static behavior that's not changing that much, once again, having dynamic code execution is not going to be uh, super useful to you. But in both these cases, platform independence can be useful. Uh, open, I'm mostly going to skip over this. I'm going to assume here uh, at the Zephyr Developer Summit that we're all interested in open, and many alternatives are open. So we're not really getting too much of an advantage by WebAssembly being open, but it's great that it is. Um, all right, looking at the rep representation, I'll move a little faster on this. Um, a bunch of these are not taking into account the fact that you have to have a runtime uh, present in the environment. So if you're in a browser, right, that's not too big of a deal. If you're on a, a microcontroller, that may be the most significant uh, use of memory on your device. Um, so that's obviously going to be an issue. Uh, also, if you're just thinking about uh, being able to minimize um, 
the size of, of the code that you're getting down on a device. Uh, there are other ways to do that, and they're going to pretty much always be more efficient than having a uh, interpreter you need to put on the device and then fetching uh, a module to run on that interpreter. Um, and a lot of times, raw speed is also not our, our most important attribute. And you may be willing to trade that off for um, things like conserving power or um, uh, you know, being able to go to sleep more often, that sort of thing. So once again, WebAssembly not giving us a lot of advantage there in a vacuum. Uh, but portability is kind of related to the platform independence. Um, and so the portable representation um, that WebAssembly gives us is really, at least for today, with what we're concerned about, uh, the most valuable attribute uh, of WASM in this context. All right, so if we look at a system uh, where we're using a WebAssembly across heterogeneous compute, um, we think about that a lot at Goliath, and what that may look like is having a lot of devices on one side and then uh, some type of middleware in the middle that is getting that data off the device uh, into a cloud somewhere else um, or to a um, consumer application somewhere else. So uh, we like to talk about the device side and the cloud side and then having middleware in the middle where you can um, optimize that data, you can transform that data, um, and then you can ultimately deliver it to where you want to use it and consume it. Um, and this is bi-directional, right? This could be going from uh, your backend um, or from your cloud uh, down to devices or vice versa. Uh, today we're going to be looking primarily at data flowing from devices uh, to your cloud. So why might you want to run WebAssembly at kind of each stage in the system here? Uh, well, if you want to run it on something like Goliath, uh, you're probably going to have a runtime provided for you. You're not under the constraints that you would have on a device, so you know, having a runtime present is not something that's much of a concern. Um, and you can provide optimization uh, by um, you know, perhaps filtering data um, or compressing it or something like that uh, before it ends up uh, on your cloud backend. You might want to run it on your cloud backend to uh, have full control uh, of how you're executing code. You might actually want to get, uh, if you're building a product on top of a system like this, you might want to get um, WASM modules or, or code written by um, your customer to be able to run it against data in your backend um, or take action on data, such as alerting, which is uh, an example that we're going to look at today. And then you might want to do it um, on your device. We have a lot of customers and users uh, who have cellular devices. And obviously, when you're using cellular, you're concerned about bandwidth. Um, so if you want to maybe reduce the amount of data uh, that is um, sent over a cellular network, uh, this could be a useful way to um, you know, get some optimization there that may also be able to run in other environments. OK, so uh, getting to the, the title of the talk, uh, we're going to look at WebAssembly on Zephyr, and I'm going to give a brief overview of one runtime uh, that's kind of, uh, in my approximation, really the most popular for embedded devices right now. Um, and then we're going to jump into some code and, and look at how that actually works. So uh, WebAssembly Micro Runtime, or Whammer, uh, if you've been to other talks this week, it's come up a few times. Um, this is uh, under the Bytecode Alliance, which is where lots of the WebAssembly work um, happens. Uh, it's optimized for constrained environments. Uh, it's kind of in the, the name there. Um, so the interpreter runtime size is about 85 kilobytes, um, which is you know not insignificant, but if you compare it to other runtimes, uh, uh, pretty incredible. Uh, it supports multiple um, uh, execution models. So regular interpreted WebAssembly that we're familiar with, uh, just-in-time compilation, and then what I mentioned earlier was ahead of time. So that's essentially where they have a compiler uh, that they offer that allows you to take a WebAssembly module, compile it for the target, um, and then uh, deliver that uh, either in the custom section, uh, which is what sometime, some runtimes do. Uh, Whammer, WebAssembly Micro Runtime, actually has a different file format for that ahead of time uh, compilation. And that's going to bring down your runtime size uh, quite a bit. Uh, if you're using native code. It also implement, implements execute in place, um, which is uh, uh, extremely useful and is not something that's uh, represented or um, implemented by all alternatives. Um, so that's a really nice attribute uh, that's available to you with Whammer. It also includes a Zephyr port, uh, which is how I'm able to give you a demo today. And uh, it's pretty close to being able to just be pulled in uh, as a Zephyr uh, module. 
Uh, and lastly, it supports WASI. Uh, this is not super useful today uh, in the um, uh, embedded um, ecosystem, but there's a lot of work that's happening in WASI to be able to expose things like SPI or I2C uh, as um, uh, standard interfaces. And uh, so that's going to make this a lot more useful and also give you kind of a, a um, uh, API to program against when you're writing uh, WebAssembly models that are intended to run in that environment. All right, so um, I'm going to stop talking up here uh, at you with slides, and we're actually just going to look at um, implementing it. So in the demo that uh, I'm going to give today, we're going to uh, create a WebAssembly module uh, that looks a lot like uh, what we have uh, in our example here. And we are going to run that uh, kind of on either side uh, of Goliath, uh, the platform in the middle there. And we're going to use that to alert on temperature values. So uh, starting off, uh, here's the, if I jump out of here into the source, here is our um, example module that we looked at uh, where we can pass, uh, in this case, it's going to be the temperature, uh, and we're going to say if it's over 22 degrees, we're going to call that alert function. Um, so I've already um, compiled this, but I'll go through the steps again, um, and we'll build it. So that goes pretty quick. And I am going to uh, take this output, and we are going to base64 encode it. Uh, let's see, simple wasm. And I am going to use our setting service uh, to basically put this uh, onto a device here, which I'm going to start up in just a moment. So this is a console um, that we have, and I'm going to go in and change our existing uh, WebAssembly module here. And we're not used to uh, settings this large usually, um, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, start up my device running here as well, which is uh, an NRF uh, 52840 development kit with an ESP32 for Wi-Fi. Um, so that's going to start up, and we should see it connect here. And essentially what it's going to do uh, is boot up, connect to this Wi-Fi network. It's going to uh, fetch that WebAssembly module um, and then uh, start uh, going through a loop. And we're going to look at the actual code uh, that it's executing. And I'm also going to make this a little bit bigger here for you all. Let me just go across and make sure. Is that big enough? Bigger? Good? All right, cool. Um, so uh, we can see here that we are streaming some temperature values, um, and then we have a uh, alert that's happening uh, for some of them, um, actually for all of them, uh, which we're going to see. Uh, any of them that are over 22, uh, we should see an alert happening here. So uh, this is the firmware that's running on the device. So up at the top, uh, we have our alert function. So this is what we are going to uh, import to our WebAssembly module that it can invoke. Uh, so in this case, uh, all it's doing is saying, whenever I get invoked, I log a message that says uh, alert. And uh, you could do something like blink a light or, or whatever you wanted in the context of your device. Um, I'm going to go down to main here and see how we start up. Uh, first thing you're going to do with um, WebAssembly micro runtime is go ahead and instantiate or init the runtime. Um, and there's a variety of settings you can provide there. Uh, one that we're going to provide is uh, the native symbols, so the symbols to be uh, imported to any module that we want to run. Uh, we're going to uh, define how we want to allocate memory um, and a variety of other settings, um, and then initialize the runtime. Uh, and then loading the WASM module, uh, I have one by default in this firmware binary that's just the, the bytes uh, that it's going to load, and then it's going to start up and connect to Goliath, uh, which is what we're doing here. Creates a uh, co-op connection over DTLS, which is how we're able to uh, fetch those settings and then stream our temperature data um, up to Goliath. Uh, we're also registering our setting there, which creates an observation, so anytime we update uh, the content of our WebAssembly module that is going to uh, be observed by the device, pulled down, um, and then it's going to start uh, invoking the new one instead. So uh, our loop here is pretty simple. Uh, it's just looping through uh, five values here um, and simulating like reading the temperature, streaming it up to Goliath, 
um, and then invoking the WASM module with whatever value it just streamed up. So um, that's great, um, but like I said, we also want to show this happening on the other side. So I'm going to start up a uh, HTTP server here just locally, and uh, what this is going to do is connect to a Goliath over WebSocket and basically receive all of those streamed values that are coming from the device. And you're seeing here that I'm getting some alerts because it's also fetching that same WASM module um, and running it uh, in what we could view here as the client application. So we're being able to use that consistent logic uh, in two very different environments, right? A microcontroller um, and our browser here. And we might want to go in and change this over time. Obviously, this is a simple example um, where the value could just be, we're going we're gonna to stop this for just a second so that, that I can uh, keep doing this demo. Um, this is a simple example where um, you know, the value could be represented by a setting or something like that, but maybe you don't want to alert um, uh, when you're calling it. Uh, I also wanted to show uh, a bit of what's happening behind the scenes here in that simple web page. Um, we're connecting, as I said, uh, to Goliath to stream those uh, values. Um, and uh, the important part here is that our alert function is uh, calling a browser API instead of a device log message. But to the WASM module, right, it's programming against the interface that we've given it, which is just an alert function that takes no values and returns no values. Um, once again, a simple example, but it shows how, depending on where it's executing, uh, then better can provide a different functionality to it. So uh, let's go ahead and change that and show the device picking it up. So I'm going to pick a value that's kind of in the middle of some of those temperatures. We'll say 65. I'm going to go ahead and recompile that. Get the base 64 for it. And copy it up. All right, so we'll change this to our new WASM module, and we should see that when we update that on the device, uh, we have a, a new WASM module coming through here, and I'm going to restart this shortly because it looks like we had a, uh, it recovered. Um, here we're seeing that we have a streaming temp, uh, and when we invoke the WASM module, uh, it's no longer alerting because it's under the value. Um, and actually, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and restart this because I think it lost connection. Um, but when it comes back up, we'll start iterating through those values, and we've changed the behavior um, so that it has a different response based on the value that's uh, passed to it. Uh, and we can do the same uh, on the web server side, pulling that in. 8,000 alert. And we should see temperature values start to stream through here uh, as well. That first one was over 65, um, but all of them that are under are going to come through uh, without our alerting logic. So we just see 48 come in under 65. Um, so yeah, that's a, kind of an example of running a WebAssembly module in two, different, two very different contexts, um, but being able to uh, provide different functionality in each. Um, so with that, I'll uh, open it up to any questions. Thank you. Uh, so that, uh, so in that demo, um, was that an example of uh, just-in-time compilation or ahead-of-time compilation? It was actually neither. It was just interpreted. Um, okay. So, yeah. so in the just-in-time case, what exactly is the input and output of that compilation? Yeah, so in the just-in-time case, uh, the, um, the input is just going to be the uh, WASM module binary. Um, and it will get compiled to native code um, on the fly uh, on the device. Um, and so, you know, that can improve performance in some cases, especially if you're in kind of a tight loop there. Thanks. Hey, uh, great, great talk. A um, couple of 
couple questions for you. Um, how, how big was the the end uh, WASM file that you, that you had there that you had to to pull over? It looked pretty small, uh, base 64 encoded. Yeah, I think it was uh, 452 bytes. That's pretty nice. Um, and then I guess like, have you, have you done um, any comparison with, you know, like you write a C function that does some, some tight loop with math, you do a WASM function that does some tight loop with math, kind of like maybe um, a digital filter might uh, and compare and contrast kind of the performance difference? Yeah, I haven't run any uh, benchmarks. There are some in the um, uh, Whammer repo, uh, I believe, that some folks have done. Um, but no, I haven't performed any myself. Okay. Thank you. We do have some online questions. So I think this is referring to the slide where you were showing uh, the Watham running in all the different places. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, is this like a combo of remote proc and Wasm, i.e. push Wasm code blobs to another processor core to run on the other side or via networks, Wi-Fi, SPI, I squared C, et cetera? Are you aiming for that? Uh, can you say the beginning of that again? Is this like a combo of uh, remote proc and Wasm? Remote proc? Remote oh, okay. DRC? Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess sort of. Uh, that wasn't an explicit goal of the uh, what I was demonstrating here. One of the things that uh, I do think is uh, interesting, if you know you're using WASI and you have uh, you leverage you know access to a spy bus or something like that, is that's going to reduce some of the portability unless if you're able to simulate that you know in a browser environment or something like that. Um, so you know it's it's not all translatable. There's portability is going to depend on what you're able to provide in each environment. So kind of the more you expand that interface you're programming against, the harder that may become. Uh, another one here, as WebAssembly continues to gain traction, how might it reshape the landscape of web development and what opportunities does it present for developers, businesses, and the broader tech ecosystem? <laughs> that is, uh, sounds like it was from a corporate briefing, but um, <laughs> I don't know how this is going to affect the life of web developers. Uh, I know that it's used in some performance uh, critical uh, web applications, uh, and it's been useful in that context. Um, I think that being able to um, run code against uh, various different environments is useful. I will say that you know, like one critique of this, and obviously I'm coming at this at working at a platform company, is is this really providing value to end users, or is this providing more value to the platform? And I think that's a fair question. Um, obviously, it's useful for um, us, for example, to be able to uh, run code in a nice sandbox, but um, you know, is that imposing um, more burden onto developers to have to learn WebAssembly and implement it and that sort of thing? I think it's a, a fair question to have. Any more questions in the room? Um, yeah, how, how would you go about, um, I mean, there's always bugs, um, even if you write it in Rust code. Um, there's always going to be bugs. So, how would you debug uh, WASI on your device? Should it should it go ahead and blow up? Sorry, can you say the end of that again? Yeah. How, how would you go about uh, debugging uh, your your WASM module on on device? Uh, should it you know fail? Yeah, it's uh, going to be more complex uh, when you introduce an interpreter. Um, so I think that's uh, uh, maybe something that you know wasn't referenced in the attributes, but something that's definitely a downside of. Uh, bringing a runtime into your firmware. Um, there are some, um, uh, there's some efforts in Whammer, I know, to make debugging a little bit easier. I think that's specifically focused on debugging the runtime. Um, one of the ways that you can do that is like, you know, you can pull exceptions out of the WebAssembly sandbox and view them in, the, um, in better. Um, but in terms of like, you know, stepping through code in the interpreter, that's going to be a lot harder, and it's probably going to be dependent on the runtime providing you some hooks to be able to do that. Um, so I would say it's a negative experience <laughs> today. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Curious if you've seen or looked at any comparisons kind of from a footprint size on like this versus MicroPython, or I know there was some Lua JIT or Lua work that was uh, talked about a couple years ago with Zephyr. Yeah, I haven't done any comparisons myself. Um, I've read some online, but I think it's you know pretty use case dependent. Um, so 
I wouldn't I wouldn't speak to any specific comparisons, but there are some available. Any last questions? Great. Thank you all for coming, and I hope everyone has a safe flight back.